thank you for joining us for our uh, panel on beneficial ownership and transparency. I'm very happy to have a very distinguished uh, panel of uh, experts with us uh, this afternoon. And uh, uh, to start off, I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, moderator, uh, Geraldine Noble. Uh, she's a barrister uh, based uh, out of Malta. Uh, she's an excellent member, and uh, she runs a, a company called Acumen Legal and Advisory. And she's going to be moderating uh, the conversation this uh, afternoon. So uh, I'm going to hand off uh, to her, and she will uh, take it from now. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you. As, as Matteo uh, mentioned, I am an English barrister um, working in Malta, and I well, well, one of the uh, topics, one of the areas of my specialism is tax, tax structuring, which is quite topical for today's uh, discussion. The, um, the dis today's discussion being on the beneficial ownership provisions. Um, I'd like to, at this point, um, ask the panelists to introduce themselves one by one by just giving, that, giving a brief outline of their background. Peter, would you like to start? Yes, uh, I will. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Um, I'm Peter Wilson. I'm working in a tax firm in London, Simmons Global, based in Stainsford. I have um, probably 30, 35 years uh, international tax experience, and for my sins, I'm currently writing a doctorate at Queen Mary University on international tax in Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And um, I'm, I'm within my last year of that, so these topics. Um, uh, when, the, when the thesis ultimately is published, you'll see my views on all these issues. Uh, thank you, thank you, Peter. Who would like to go next? Maxine? Yes. Thank you, Jolie, for for introduction, and uh, I will talk about myself a bit. Uh, I'm a partner and the managing director in and a part of the society and the uh, family is uh, So our basic uh, business is uh, to provide uh, our clients for the best affected uh, business structures, basically in EU, also all over the world. So, and uh, the reason why I'm here, going here, Today is because of uh, the changes uh, in the tax area. In the tax area is uh, quite rapidly uh, during the last uh, years. So, and uh, maybe we, we can we can uh, agree uh, or consult our clients with, with the best solutions in this environment. Thank you, Maxime. Alex? Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm Alex Cobham. I'm the Director of Research at the Tax Justice Network. Um, now, I'm an economist um, who's mainly worked on, on issues of development, inequality and tax. But the Tax Justice Network, when it's set up in 2003, quickly developed three three main um, policy uh, focuses, one of which was precisely on um, beneficial ownership. And at the time, it was seen as rather a wild, uh, optimistic um, thing to go after. Roll forward 10 years to the, the G8 um, meeting in 2013, and it's become uh, the global policy agenda. What I think is interesting now is that we're in this phase where um, you know, that initial vision might be about to come uh, into reality, but actually that uh, the proximity of that is creating a great deal of tension. So where we go from here, um, uh, well, there are a great many possibilities, and that's what I'm, I'm interested to hear other, other panellists' views on exactly that question. Thank you, Alex. And uh, Robert? Yes, so I head up the um, money laundering and corruption campaign at Global Witness. Um, for those of you who don't know, Global Witness is 
an international NGO that looks at the links between natural resources, corruption and conflict. And in almost every investigation and case study we look at, we come across the use of anonymously owned companies by criminals, corrupt politicians and others to hide what they're doing. So we've really been pushing for much greater transparency over who really owns and controls companies. And as Alex said, there's been huge progress, especially in the European Union uh, and the UK, but there's still a long way to go. Um, so very interested in having a conversation today about what the next steps look like. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I believe that's everybody. So um, thank you, which is an excellent, we have an excellent mix between lawyers, uh, practitioners at the coal face, as well as a, I should say, civil and social affairs uh, campaigners, in the broadest sense of the, that term. So let's let's start off the uh, webinar with the first with the first uh, question being, what are what are your thoughts regarding promoting greater corporate transparency within the industry? Is it ultimately a right a step in the right direction? Um, Peter, would you like to would you like to start off with your thoughts? Yes, thank you very much, Geraldine. I, th I think all this goes back um, a number of years, and we've got to we've got to look at what we're focusing on here. Um, transparency is all about helping the governments of the world um, identify those who should be paying tax and maybe haven't been. Um, tax obviously is a contribution to was a required contribution to the social agenda so that uh, infrastructure and housing and what have you and defence and what have you can be made available. So undeniably transparency is a critical part of uh, governments having access uh, to information to enable them to identify uh, who's been evading uh, we can put aside a little bit for the moment about who's been avoiding because avoiding is a much more difficult concept to really put a box around. But ev evasion is, is pretty, I think, pretty straightforward. It's where somebody has a liability that they haven't fulfilled in, in either, either actively or just passively. So tra transparency um, is the, the Think, I think uh, to give the government uh, access to the information to be able to pursue those uh, who haven't fulfilled their obligations. Now, the separate question which we'll talk about later is what the governments actually can do and are capable of doing with the information once they re receive it. And uh, we can talk about that later because I've got some particularly strong, strong views on that. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure you have. As I'm sure Robert has uh, has very strong views in this arena. Rob, Rob would you like to uh, pick up the thread? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I often come back to is um, a statement that was made by Mo Ibrahim. For those of you who don't know, he is an African uh, business entrepreneur behind the kind of very valuable uh, Sydney's company called Celtel, and he has said that he doesn't see why there's any business case for anonymous company ownership. So just important to say that the sort of work that me and Alex are doing to try and push for greater corporate transparency uh, is also backed up by business leaders and lots of political leaders. Um, and I think a lot of this is about coming back to the point of what companies are meant to do. Um, you know, limited liability is, is a great invention. It means that people can set up businesses, it means they can fail, and it means they can go on to set up their next business and they don't end up in debtedness. Um, and when limited liability was originally created, the idea was that in return for this privilege of being able to have limited liability, you would also have transparency about who you were in order to foster accountability and good corporate governance. But I think over the last sort of 100 years, 50 years, we've, we've seen a change. You know, companies have increasingly been used in certain circumstances for high behaviour and high bad uh, corporate behaviour. And so the sort of work and measures that we're advocating for are about trying to get back to that idea of the company as a way of creating economic growth, not as a way of hiding what's going on and 
And so I'm a real strong proponent of saying it's not just governments that need access to information or come from information, but it's also their business partners, their suppliers, their customers, their employees, um, journalists, politicians, academics. So for those reasons, I think it's really, really positive to see the direction and the steps that we've been taking over the last two or three years towards greater transparency and information. Uh, Alex, uh, Alex, your thoughts on? Yeah, I, I think uh, you know Robert's really said it all. You know that that point about limited liability being uh, a right that brings with it responsibilities. You know, which at a minimum are some kind of public records, ideally of accounts and around beneficial ownership. I think that's very important. What we've seen is a an erosion of that rights and responsibility relationship towards arguably the idea of anonymous companies as the, the kind of paradigmatic irresponsible business. Um, you know, there is no good reason, as, as many people have now said, there is no good reason not to know who you're doing business with. There's certainly no good business reason. I think we, we need to see this not as a, an unreasonable imposition on business, but just a, a straightforward movement back to the aligning of those rights and responsibilities. Okay. And, and Maxine, be, be, being a practitioner in this field um, and, and dealing with, uh, with clients um, who, uh, who, who desire companies, what, what are your thoughts on, um, on, on, on the corporate transparency? Okay. I would partially agree with the panelists uh, with regard to uh, that uh, today's uh, we need to be more transparent in, in the corporate sector. Uh, actually, because uh, there is a government who should uh, access on their territory, because if you are if you are like an entrepreneur using the infrastructure of this particular country, you have to pay a share, uh, a fair share of taxes in this country. But uh, these issues should not be a block uh, item for the growth of the business. So uh, transactional uh, cost should not be affected on the business. If uh, the governments will uh, provide with a clear uh, policy and the mechanism of the, uh, using this idea of transparency, maybe uh, it will work but uh, if this information will be, will be in use uh, on, um, on other uh, issues maybe if this will be an issue for business for doing uh, or not doing business in this country so it means that uh, it depends um, what kind of uh, information we should have in publicity and what kind of information we can, can be uh, shared with the authorities by, uh, by special authorities. Yes, but thank you. My, my own view is, is, is although I, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure that limited liability companies were originally uh, put into place to generate transparency, they were indeed put into place to generate entrepreneurship. So as Maxime has um, indicated, there does need to be uh, some, some balance between transactional costs and um, the, the proposed rules or proposed discussions around uh, beneficial ownership registrars, reg registries and, and, and the such. But I think in today's, in t today's age, 2015, there can be no doubt that there is no, no need for um, for anonymous companies, and I wonder whether the same could be said for other vehicles such as trusts and foundations as well, because this isn't just a limited liability company problem; it is to do with um, tax structuring of assets, whether they be corporate or personal. And uh, you know, I come across. Uh, instances where there is a mix indeed of say corporate vehicles, limited liabilities, limited li uh, partnerships uh, in and trusts and foundations perhaps at the top or so. Um, I was wondering whether any of the panellists had, um, had anything 
would say about those personal asset structure vehicles? Yeah, I certainly do, Ger Geraldine. Um, but be before I, before I pop into that, I think I think uh, the transparency issue is kind of presupposing that there's bad behaviour by everybody involved in companies. Because in the circumstances which in which companies behave properly, um, and the people behind those companies behave properly, one could argue that there isn't a need to know who the companies are owned, uh, who the companies are owned by, um, which is an interesting thought to take forward. And there can be some situations in which uh, you might not want the ownership of a company to be public uh, in the context of when that company owns some very private intellectual property. And you're wanting to you're wanting to stop uh, uh, es espionage or something or other. Um, in re relation to trusts, trusts are really interesting, and all you need to do to uh, understand how difficult it is to get to know about beneficial ownership of trusts is to look at the struggle that the Financial Action Task Force has in actually defining beneficial ownership with respect to a, to a trust or defining ownership um, that's one well, that's well it's one. much simpler isn't it I mean I mean you know when it comes to especially limited liability companies you're either you know you're a shareholder or you either act on someone's behalf or you don't as opposed to as you're saying a trust Peter well correct and I think the behavior point is really interesting because I've recently been involved in a matter where um, an individual, uh, an individual has participated in transactions, which, uh, in my view, have been devised, or the format of the transaction has been devised to fraudulently evade tax. Now, that transaction was in the individual's name. The individual didn't have to use a company to form the transaction, nor did he have to use a trust to form the transaction just a transaction in his own name um, but trusts trusts whether it's a discretionary trust or a fixed trust the different types of trusts I mean it, you look at if you can look at this Swiss Confederation and taxations uh, rulings in 2007 on what a revocable trust or, a, or an irrevocable trust is and it all goes back to the economic reality of the trust so um, you're absolutely right. We need to get more transparency into trusts in the same way that we have that we have into companies. Uh, but I still I still think uh, we we need to educate those who use companies and trusts to improve their behaviour better, so we don't get so we don't get so uptight about who actually owns the entities. Um, Alex, would you like to come in now? Um, I think there's an interesting point there that Peter makes about you know whether we can construct particular, perhaps very um, actually artificial um, examples in which there might possibly be an argument for anonymity. Um, I have to say, in general, I don't find them very convincing. But I think we should also turn it round in any case and say, all other things being equal would we have more confidence doing business with a company where the ownership is transparent and on record or with a company that is anonymously owned and I can't imagine anyone would ever answer that they'd have more confidence doing business with um, uh, a company where they just didn't know who the owners were so I think in general it's difficult to see very convincing examples where anonymity has has benefits for business so, so, do you, so do you think there's a difference between um, doing business uh, doing business with a, a, a company and, and, and knowing right through the transparency the ownership of that company as opposed to perhaps the more private nature of personal asset structuring through trusts and foundations? So I think there is and I don't mean to say that there is uh, necessarily a great case for anonymity in the, the trust example, but I think it's clear that there are differences um, in the way that, say, the, the US um, FATCA is approaching 
trust is interesting. I think we will increasingly see some agreement on the extent to which you can reasonably cut through trust structures in order to identify beneficial owners and, and using that to, um, to reduce the opportunities for abuses, not only of tax, of course, but of uh, other forms of corruption, money laundering, terrorism, financing, and so on. Um, but I think it's certainly true that the point that's been uh, well made by, um, by Peter and, and by you, that trust structures have different implications for the clarity of uh, beneficial ownership. And Robert, your, your organisation, do, do they see that there's any difference between knowing um, the ultimate beneficial owner and the structure of a company as opposed to a trusting foundation? Yeah, I mean, they are, they are different uh, ways of managing assets and money, and they have got different history and, and different complications. I mean, ultimately, I think we come back to the point about you want to know who you're doing business with, and we don't feel that people should use whatever structures are out there to kind of hide their identity. I also think it's worth being really clear that what we're talking about here is information on, on ownership. I mean, the new UK beneficial ownership registry, and I've been very involved in the development of that, is a fairly prescribed list of information that's going to be available. Uh, and in addition, there's going to be what the UK government is calling a protection regime. So you can apply to have your beneficial ownership information not be put in the public domain if you feel there's a good reason, particularly over um, physical safety. You know, an example that's often cited is, is life science research and um, animal testing. So I think it's important to say we're not calling for you know, a Scandinavian-style publishing of everyone's tax return from full disclosure of everyone's assets and intellectual property. It's more about understanding who is owning and controlling these sorts of structures. Okay. So, so before before we move on to the practical practical um, laws regulations that are being discussed and, and being put into place, particularly uh, the from the UK. Maxine, from a practitioner's standpoint, do you see that there's much that there's much or any difference between transparency needed in the uh, corporate world as opposed to the more personal uh, asset foundation uh, trusts arena? I would say that, uh, again, it's, it's an issue of cost uh, for the business. For instance, uh, trust and foundations are very flexible structures uh, to uh, allocate assets within this structure. So, for instance, we have a lot of projects uh, where we use uh, trust uh, for clients and uh, foundations as well. Uh, a lot of them are just you know, uh, hide who owns the uh, holding company or the assets in different countries, but also to provide the proper tool for, for instance, uh, employee co ownership model uh, because trust and foundation is a very unique uh, structure for this kind of ownership models. For instance, if you are uh, want to or make an employee buyout. Uh, it's better to uh, organize this deal with your employees through the trust or the foundations, uh, but not directly, for instance. And this is uh, if uh, you need to um, open everything. Uh, it's, it's an issue of uh, transactional costs. I mean, again, we are taking to the issue we have already discussed that uh, it may be too costly for business and governments should provide with the proper solution uh, on this. So, uh, yes, uh, and uh, another issue, uh, I think uh, we uh, as uh, industry professionals should be more uh, um, precisely in the KYC procedure. So if, you, if we uh, see that uh, the person who wants to set up a trust and foundations uh, uh, like are probably not uh, a real entrepreneur, but uh, the person who are uh, at the government relations with some in the, uh, some countries. It could be an issue for us from the ethical point of view to provide service for this kind of clients or not. This is 
should be in balance, I suppose. Okay. So, so, so Maxima actually brings up a valid point, which is um, how, 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 how much information and how, how practical can this actually be on a, a day, in, in, in a day-to-day -day scenario. Um, there is also the, the responsibilities I should highlight, not only uh, by the individuals concerned in the company itself, but by practitioners tax practitioners, legal practitioners, accounting practitioners who advise these individuals, uh, these, these corporates, to structure in such a manner as to um, perhaps cloud the, um, the ultimate beneficial owner or the true ownership of the companies. Um, what, what, what bearing has these professional, or what responsibilities do these professional advisors have, do you think, in respect of advising clients correctly and responsibly. Uh, do, do any of the panelists have anything to say about that? The, the responsibility of professional advisors? Oh, I do. Um, obviously, professional advisors um, owe an obligation. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's really a an obligation. We're paid by the clients who ask us to help them. But we owe, we owe an obligation to society to make sure that uh, the advice that we give is, is uh, in accordance with the rules and regulations. Um, I, for one, I, for one, will not work for anybody who wants to pay no, no tax. Uh, no, no, neither will I. Yeah, you know, the first, I'm not, just not interested in doing any of that and just not really interested in helping people conceal or, um, or, or uh, camouflage what they're doing unless there's, uh, in my view, a commercial reason. Um, um, so very clearly, very, very clearly, we professional, obliga uh, we professional advisors, I believe, have a, have a higher duty than, than solely to the people who are paying us to give them the, the advice. But that's, but that's a positive obligation you've put, you and myself have put upon ourselves, as opposed to the, the negative obligation of you do something wrong and you'll, 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 you'll get locked up or you'll get, or you'll, or you'll get some, you know, some penalty applied to you. Oh, there, there, are, there are plenty of instances around the world now where pro professional advisors, if they promote um, um, and have serious con consequences, uh, there are plenty of instances around the world of advisors who, who assist in structuring illegal tra transactions uh, can, find them, can find themselves being asked very, very difficult to respond to questions. So those of us who have the right approach don't seem to be worried by these issues though. Yes, yes. And, and, and I have to say, an example springs to mind. I had a 90-year-old uh, individual who, who wanted, who lives between two companies, and um, and has been doing his own tax affairs in in order not to pay tax anywhere. And um, I, I I have to think, you know, surely there's surely there's that you have to give back to the countries, the jurisdictions in which you live in some way, and not and not just um, you know push yourself through the cracks. But, but Robert, you, you brought up that you've been working with the English government in respect of the, 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 the proposed public register. Uh, yes, so we've been discussing in the runoff, I'm, I'm on one of the um, expert working groups that's developing some of the statutory and non-statutory guidance around the new register. Um, I suppose I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points. Um, mm, please I think do. Geraldine and Peter, you are in the vast majority of professional advisors who will say... I hope not. I hope not. Well, we, we don't want to facilitate... You are... It, who, who, you know, we don't want to facilitate sort of corruption or money laundering or taxation. Um, sadly, there is a small minority of people who not take the same position. Um, and often what we see in our examples and case studies is often a lawyer or advisor who's really essential to setting up these sorts of structures. Um, and as, as of course you'll, you'll all know, you have anti-money laundering obligations placed upon you, um, and part of those obligations require certain professional advisors to 
identify all the sort of information that's going to be on the UK register. So you, know, you need to identify kind of show ownership information, you need to verify that information in certain circumstances. So actually, I, think, I think this is a point that Maxine brought up about the KYC on the onboarding obligations that, that practitioners have to do anyway. So perhaps, so well, I think one of his points is why then should this public register be necessary? So there are a couple of points on, on why we need a public register. I mean, first of all, a lot of the pressure for this came from law enforcement officials in the UK who said they simply find it very, very challenging to find beneficial ownership information in their law cases. Um, and I think one of the things that struck me uh, about the leak of, of information from the British Virgin Islands actually highlighted that a lot of company service providers either had inadequate or no beneficial ownership information. So there's, there's, a, real, there's a real lack of this information out there. Um, and I would actually go as far to say is there's a lack of information and it's probably worse in financial centres such as the UK and certainly the United States than perhaps it is in some of the more traditional offshore centres um, where at least on paper the rules are stronger. Um, so I suppose the points I was trying to make is, um, you know, any company should be able to find its beneficial ownership information and will have to do inquiries about its beneficial ownership information if it's going to have any relationship with someone who has to perform KYC, um, but also that the existing systems aren't, aren't working properly. And again, that's not just coming from a non-governmental organisation. That's also comments from, from law enforcement and from tax authorities. So um, I was, uh, uh, well, the, the UK has been at the forefront and uh, at, um, try, at trying to uh, get this uh, beneficial re ownership register, register legislation in place. Um, some people could be quite cynical and say it was at the forefront because of the, the, the recent elections, uh, got, uh, you know, um, in England that something needed to be done, that it had, something had to be seen to be done. Um, one argument that leads strength to that is the fact that um, Guernsey does not. Um, uh, the Guernsey's company register does not require um, disclosure of uh, shareholders. So um, it seems to some quite funny that the UK is now leading um, the charge to beneficial ownership registration uh, when it has um, territories uh, that, that, that doesn't even provide the most basic of information. So, well, well, could you could you go into some 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 detail regarding the um, the working uh, the proposals that are currently uh, yeah. being touted? I, I'm happy to do that. I mean, just on your previous point, I totally agree with you, Charlie. I think the UK government should be putting more pressure on the UK, uh, the UK territories to, to follow its lead. And in fact, um, both Gibraltar. I didn't. I, I, I didn't see. I'm sorry, Robert. I didn't see the the, the, the EU have just come up. Have just have just announced uh, the uncooperative uh, jurisdictions list, and I didn't see the Guernsey on it. I mean, there was a, there was a um, I, I think uh, one of the things that I was about to say actually is that the new will be voluntarily required by certain Jersey and uh, Gibraltar is part of the EU rules. Gibraltar will become part of the new EU rules because we have new EU rules also requiring a degree of legislation transparency. But your, your original question was around the UK register. Yes. So the legislation created and registered was passed just before the election. Cross party support. Um, from January next year, January 2016, all UK companies, registered companies, and limited liability partnerships will have to start collecting beneficial ownership information. Uh, the obligation will be primarily on the company collect information on who its ultimate owners are, um, but if you believe you are a beneficial owner of a UK company and the UK company has not got in touch, you need to disclose that information to the company. But when you say UK, when you say UK, are you including the Channel Islands? No, the Channel Islands aren't, aren't technically part of the United Kingdom. So it's, 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 it's companies registered with Companies House and it's 
UK limited liability companies, limited liability partnerships, and I, there are a couple of other uh, smaller types of companies, but it's, it's, it's just UK registered companies. So England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland? Uh, I think that's right, yes. So it will not include a foreign company that registers a branch of the UK because the UK doesn't have the ability to impose those conditions mm. on those sorts of companies. So it's, a, it's, a, it, it's UK, it's the sort of three, four million odd companies that are registered with Companies House. Uh, and so from January 2016, those companies will have to collect beneficial ownership information. And from April 2016, those companies will have to provide beneficial ownership information to the UK Companies House. Uh, and then it will be available for the public. So that's the timetable. Um, there's a lot more detail that you can find through the website of the business department in the UK. Um, and there are currently consultations going out on some of the information that's going to be collected and also this protection regime where you can apply to have your beneficial ownership information not disclosed to the public if you feel there's a sort of physical threat or a threat to you because of that. Okay. Okay, so, 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 so already we know that this proposed register will not cover uh, the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man, and that it will not cover uh, branches, what about um, permanent establishments. So there, there, there seems to be already gaps um, in this sort of like comprehensive register. See, I, I would say I don't think anyone has promised that it will be comprehensive. You know, the UK is the first country in the world to do this. Um, the UK has very clearly said we don't want UK companies to be abused for money laundering. And we also believe that transparency over company ownership is good for business. Um, now, obviously, there are numerous other jurisdictions around the world which have not promised to create public registers. Um, and there are still other ways in which you can create company structures. You know, you're not going to solve this problem overnight, but the UK step is a really important first step. And uh, as of last week, the European updated anti-money laundering directive came into force. And that will require EU member states to create central registries of beneficial ownership of companies. And there'll be different tiers of access. So law enforcement will get full access. Um, obliged entities um, lawyers, accountants will get access to carry out their customer due diligence, so you all will have access. And the members of the public will get access if they can show a legitimate interest. And that phrase, legitimate interest, that will be defined differently by different member states. So it will depend on how, how far they want to go. And is it proposed that this will be a central uh, EU reg register? No, it will be up to each member state to decide how it wants to implement each register. So, 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 so what, what, are, what are your thoughts on that, gentlemen? Uh, Maxime? I think, uh, yes. Uh, because, Maxime, Maxim, you, you will be, you, as a practitioner, you'll be one of those individuals that will be access, accessing uh, maybe Cypriot, the Cypriot Register, or indeed the UK, perhaps. Uh, for instance, there is two, uh, two um, Two cases I would like to discuss with your colleagues. Um, and uh, uh, for, for instance, if you have a foundation without any beneficiaries, just uh, as an independent capital as itself, uh, first case, and if you have uh, uh, a trust with the beneficiaries as minors or non born children of the particular family. No, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. Sorry, Max. I don't think those are items <coughs> that will be on the central on, on, on each country's uh, yes. registry. That, that's why I'm asking uh, if this information should be placed on this register, because there is no physical persons uh, who are formally uh, a beneficiary owners of the structures. So, uh, in case of foundations, there is a legal opportunity not to place beneficiaries in the statute of the foundation. And, uh, uh, for instance, in Sweden, here uh, we have a lot of foundations that own uh, a huge part of the economy, and uh, the old families, the Swedish families, own this. Uh, uh, conglomerates, uh, financial, industrial conglomerates through the foundations, and they are not 
technically they are not uh, beneficial owners of these foundations because uh, they just uh, doing their boat work on these foundations and they control but not own directly and uh, this is the issue that uh, um, the, the government and the EU level should recognize that not in every case we can place a physical person as a beneficial owner of the structure because uh, the hundreds of years of the history uh, both in UK and in uh, Northern uh, Europe there is a lot of uh, things that are uh, already done and works and uh, in this case you cannot play the physical person as a beneficial owner. Mm. No, no, no I, I agree, it's hard to register an unborn child. <laughs> 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 so that was a tax joke. Um, uh, uh, Peter, do you, do you have any thoughts on on, uh, on what Maxim and Rob, Robert have um, have said about uh, individual country registers or some form of central uh, beneficial ownership register? Um, I, I'm in favour of a central register, merely because uh, if there is a central register, there's going to be uniformity and uh, I'm for uniformity. Uh, I think the need for registers are very interesting because if we're talking about a need for a register so we know who we're doing business with, then yes, that's a very good idea. Um, if it's, an, if it's a, about revenue authorities uh, getting information on who actually owns entities, um, then there are ways already for them to get yes. that information. And, you know, if we, we're talking about the Crown dependencies, uh, there are the many factors, many FATCARs, and if you want to have a look at those, um, if you want to have a look at those, uh, you would be, I think you'd be happy that, um, that there will be more information available and if you really want to, really want to go into some depth about uh, what individual countries around the world have done, or what their legal systems are, and so that you can determine whether you can get your hands on information, the Global Forum Peer Review reports are an amazing wealth of information. Now they're not necessarily all up to date, obviously, because they come out they come out as each country reviewed, but uh, those peer review reports set out a substantial amount of information on the local country legal obligation with respect to companies and trusts and, and, how, and how the revenue authorities deal with that. So, um, I certainly agree that if, if we're talking about uh, registers so we know who own companies, absolutely, and I think it should be a central register, but if we're if we're talking about in the short term, how do the revenue authorities know who's behind the entities? Uh, they, they, they certainly have their ways um, uh, 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 to do that at the moment. And the real question is, I think there, is whether the revenue authorities have the capability uh, to deal with uh, the requirement of accessing information and then to deal with, with the volume of information that they may get when they, when they ask for it. Uh, Alex, as, as a director of uh, tax justice, I, I fully expect you to be 100% behind uh, beneficial registers. Are you? Are you? Are you is, is, your, is your group? Is your is your team more so towards individual country or some European wide regist registry group? I, mean, I think by and large, uh, in terms of two things, the, the efficiency with which regulators um, uh, and legal officers can take action and then the, the value of many eyes, the public scrutiny. I think, you know, we'd uh, certainly be in favour of um, public registers in each case, whether they're necessarily fully joined up or not. It's the step of taking them public where, you know, for example, we, we know that the, the UK company's house um, uh, data as it stands 
um, has a great many weaknesses. You know, a great many, I mean, hundreds of thousands of companies register, never provide accounts, and then disappear without ever having um, uh, published those uh, that material. And that's within a public structure, but at least we're in a position where we can track that information to an extent. And I think increasingly, um, as the world gets better at using large amounts of data, having this kind of data um, publicly available and indeed online in, in open data formats is the way to ensuring the type of scrutiny that makes the providers of that information accountable. I know we've had questions uh, raised uh, in the list here about whether you can expect people who are trying to pull a fast one to provide reasonable data. I don't think you can, but having a system that picks up failures to provide accurate data, which we simply don't have in most cases now, um, is the step towards uh, reducing at least the scale of that problem. So central registers, public, and eventually at least the ability to join them up. I don't think it needs to be one single structure though administered centrally. Okay, uh, but, but Robert has pointed out that there will, will be instances where, because Alex, you, you for, for, from tax justice, I know, I know that, that, that you're a great champion of the people the people's right to knowledge, the people, people's right to information. But as Robert has... <laughs> but as Robert has highlighted, there will be instances when uh, individuals, when companies can apply not to have their, that information made public. So that, so that wouldn't that defeat, Alex, part of your um, you know, reason of being? I don't think so. I mean, we're, we're talking about... Um, something near but not necessarily um, achieving universality there's always you know in any individual case and in this broad area trade-offs between um, privacy uh, and the, the value of access for individual companies or individual beneficial owners to be able to make an individual case that in their particular circumstances um, the, the uh, I can imagine in many cases being made yeah, and I think you know we will need to have confidence in the authorities that are making the judgments um, about privacy. And if you were to see, you know, for example, one European member state have a what appears to be a disproportionate number of cases where they um, agree to to uh, retain anonymity, I think you'd start raising questions. But again, it's having that kind of information in the public domain that would even allow those questions to be raised, allow some scrutiny if there appear to be um, decisions being made that aren't necessarily in the public interest. And Alex, you, you bring up quite a, a personal point because I'm, 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 I'm aware, for instance, that France and Germany have very high standards when it, when it comes to privacy and data protection. Um, so, so I could imagine that they'd be more apt to protect individuals' information than, than say, the UK. I think it'll be an interesting process over time, because I think one thing that will happen as this becomes more um, widespread is there will be a greater realization of both the value of this information being public, but also the fairly limited, actually, number of cases where, where risks arise. I think greater public awareness of those issues will, will probably bring um, countries towards something like a common point over time, whereas perhaps at the moment the differences are such that um, you, know, you might expect to see some quite big systematic um, uh, differences arise. It'll be interesting to see over, let's say, five to ten years, how those processes do pan out. Mm -hmm. I, I would say perhaps systematic and cultural. Yeah, no, I think that's yeah. fair. Um, and you know, the different, simply the different um, uh, historical patterns around um, property rights as well as uh, company structures um, and, and structures of other um, legal vehicles means that you're starting from quite different points um, in terms of the, uh, the frameworks quite apart from the cultures and obviously those things are not unrelated. So it, yeah, I think we'll, we'll see some shaking out of this and we may see some, um, some retention of, uh, of differences over time, but overall the, the pattern will be, uh, I think, a very positive one in broadly the same direction of much greater uh, transparency and accountability. 
So, so, so far, our, our conversation has been very UK Eurocentric. How, how, how if, if we, uh, well, obviously the UK is proceeding along the, its own uh, beneficial ownership registrar. So, and then the EU, no doubt, will, will implement it either individually for each member state, you know, allowing, allowing each member state to implement some form of register or having some sort of, and I would say, uh, central register, but I, I, I don't know, I don't know how, if that will be practical with, and whether that would be put into place, but how does, how does this apply to non-EU countries? What, what would be your suggestions in um, having other sovereign states that are not within the EU um, have forms of, of uh, public registers? Do, do you think there's any way that, that uh, we could influence um, other countries, other non-EU countries, to implement such registers? Do you think there's any need for non-EU members non, uh, to have such registers? I think there's quite a good chance we'll see something like a race to the top in this area. You know, once you have some major economies going in this direction, it's much more likely. And this, I think you, you raised a question earlier about why the UK might have done this and how meaningful is it if the UK isn't bringing its own crown dependencies or overseas territories with it. I think these are fair questions, but actually the UK can hardly claim to be a leader when it hasn't itself taken this step. But once it has taken this step, then the position it's in vis-a-vis -vis its own crown dependencies or overseas territories to say, look, you're starting to look like an outlier at the, the bad end of the spectrum um, is quite different. And if you have a broad process across the EU, then again, the ability of some of those states to talk to uh, a president in the United States and say, look, we know that you always say that it's, it's states' individual decisions to have um, highly um, opaque corporate structures and that they compete on that basis, but isn't it really about time, thinking of your international responsibilities, that the US stopped being a laggard in this and caught up? So I think you may actually see increasing pressure on, on those outlying jurisdictions. And it's quite a different process from the, you know, if you think back to the, the efforts in the late 90s, say, to try and, um, you know, enforce some changes in small offshore financial centers, rather than putting some of the usual suspects up against the wall, this process is seeing finally some of the major economies take a lead. So it feels like it, it has the potential to be a much more positive uh, dynamic. Oh, well, well, to hear well, others. Yeah. Yes. Does, has anybody got any other viewpoints on this? In respect of non-EU countries having such registries? <laughs> registries? Um, uh, from, from my experience, Geraldine, and in my journey on my research, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that some of these other countries are going to be so attracted uh, to the prospect of uh, transparency through these registers. Um, well, 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 let, well let's, let's be honest. Let, let's be completely honest. Some of these other jurisdictions, their whole reason to be is the, is the, is the anonymous nature of the, of, of, of the structures that, that can be set up. So there will always be you know, um, some well, jurisdictions not, that, that would not want to have this in place. I'm not talking about the offshore financial centres. I'm talking about some of the developing countries. Now, if it becomes a requirement for inbound FDI, for if it becomes a requirement of the country that's attracting the inbound FDI to actually know who the owners are of the companies um, that are providing that FDI, I think yes, I think there there will be a move. There will be a move to more transparency. Um, but I don't know whether I'm comforted or not comforted by the fact that uh, Hong Kong doesn't seem to be encouraged to sign up to a lot of the uh, uh, mutual assistance and multilateral exchange of information uh, uh, regulations that are coming about. 
and you know, and I'm just, I'm, and I'm just not sure whether whether the the parallel movement that I detect out there in the development of a different economic block might might have an impact upon uh, upon whether some of these developing countries are prepared to go along with the with the, with the establishment of these registers. If it's in, I think what we can say, if it's in those countries' selfish financial interests to have it done, then it will be done. If it's not, then maybe it won't be. Well, um, I, 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 I have to agree with you, Peter. And I, I wonder whether, whether an EU or individual EU country registries will actually affect uh, those, those EU countries negatively from a financial perspective, i.e., say, um, someone who who, you know, not for tax avoidance, not for tax evasion, maybe it's for some other reason, uh, does not want their, their affairs to be public, perhaps they'll go elsewhere to set up structures rather than uh, ha having to show their information um, if they decide upon an EU state uh, in which to structure their affairs. Is, is, there, is there not a possibility that, that such public registers, registers could affect the EU negatively? Robert, would you, do you have any I mean, thoughts on that? It was, it was interesting. This was a question that was 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 asked of of, the, of Vince Cable, the previous business secretary in the UK, who was responsible for developing this. And he said, you know, we've ultimately chosen the view that transparency over company ownership is better for the UK economy and will create a more healthy business environment than the current secrecy. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to bear in mind. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that, yes, we are talking here about a trade-off between personal privacy and, uh, and more corporate transparency. You know, we've always been very clear about that. But ultimately, we think that the benefit for society lies with greater transparency. Uh, and one other thing I just add in terms of the international element of this is you're seeing this discussion come up everywhere. So it's being discussed at the G20. Being discussed at the G7, um, the UN is revising its sort of development framework, and it's a big global negotiation. And beneficial ownership transparency is part of that negotiation and discussion. Um, and I think the other thing to say is that it's important to see this is a step-by-step -step process. You know, we think we really need to start with the big major financial centres and some of the offshore centres where this is a real problem. You know, I'm not at the moment advocating that every single country including developing countries, create a public register. Um, I think we need to see how it works in Europe, the UK and elsewhere, um, develop and refine the way in which it works, um, and hopefully get towards a global situation where you can't use company ownership to hide what you're doing. Um, Ma Maxine, Maxine um, you, you deal with you know, client structuring through the, the EU directly. Um, do you, can you see that there will be a, a, a negative financial outcome um, because they're, they're, they will be forced to publish their, their details? I suppose, uh, to my mind, I suppose that these uh, initiatives uh, also in UK, in uh, EU level, also uh, OECD and G20. So I think some of the the best practices from this, uh, based on the realization in the UK and in the EU, uh, some of the countries of G20 uh, or OECD countries may implement the same things on their plan. But I, I suppose that uh, these uh, particular initiatives should be focused more on IML and uh, corruption issues uh, rather than on real businesses. Because, uh, yes, of course, it's, if this information will uh, affect on the real business, real entrepreneurs, that this will be painful for them. And uh, if uh, the government will uh, provide with the proper solution to prevent uh, or to uh, to make to make sure that uh, each transaction and uh, each company is not the uh, height uh, of the corruption and IML. Yes, it, it's good, but uh, in general, the real business, uh, the people who pay taxes, uh, should not pay additional costs 
on I would I would say again cost and cost on the on this transparency um, issue. So 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 in effect, you're saying that there should be a cost benefit balance analysis and balance. Yes. Yeah, but, but, some, but some could argue having some form of regi some some central place in which there is a register could, in fact, assist service pro service providers like yourself and and, and and well and Peter and myself in the sense of we'd have somewhere else to go in which to validate uh, information that's given to us by individual by corporations because there is this central repository. Yes, for sure. There should be a proper, a proper procedure for this. I'm not saying that uh, uh, transparency is uh, you should uh, go to Google and see everything. Uh, there is should be a, a proper procedure for this kind of information to get this information. So if you have some uh, uh, arguments to receive this information, you should receive. But uh, through the authorities and through the the proper position uh, procedure uh, to get this information. So um, otherwise, see, I think it will be too painful for the business uh, to. Uh, it's a it's a bureaucracy item as well, uh, and um, I suppose it will not work uh, totally when it will be online without any procedure. From, from, from just talking about the jurisdiction in which I work, Malta, I have to say that um, being a small island, having quite efficient tax laws and rates anyhow, Malta, the service, pra the service practitioners here in Malta are very much aware of the need for transparency um, in the structures that we put into place. And I, and and I think, I, I believe that there's much more of an emphasis on proper economic substance of these vehicles so, 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 so that they cannot just take advantage of um, loopholes, remittance systems and, and, and the so, such like. So from, from the Maltese perspective, I mean, I mean this is information, uh, UBO information is information that we would disclose anyhow to companies registrar here and to the tax authorities. So I cannot see that having a, 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 a Maltese public registry would, would affect Malta anyhow, because those, th th those parties that do not want to disclose that information just simply go elsewhere. And good, good riddance. Good riddance. Just on that, sorry, point, Geraldine, I think that is the sort of spirit with which we take this. You know, we want to close down the space in which the corrupt the money launderers can operate. So I think your final line, good riddance, is really important. No, we're not going to change the world overnight. We're not going to get rid of money laundering or tax evasion overnight. But what we can do is we can close down the spaces where they operate. There's a reason people want to use the EU for money laundering or to bring the proceeds there of their crime, because it's an attractive centre, it's legitimate, it's a nice place to live, it's a nice place to manage your assets. If you close down that space, you know, you just have to start looking elsewhere. You know, I think, Peter, you mentioned Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai, these are all financial centers. Um, but I think we should see this as a step-by-step -step progress to closing down the space where the criminals can operate and promoting a better, uh, more effective business environment. Robert, I'd, if I may just take up that point. Uh, I, find, I find that Singapore is one of the most difficult jurisdictions in the world to form a company. So you know, it's got it's got obvious uh, tax benefits as a jurisdiction, but uh, Singapore is, is such, a, in my experience, is such a, a, a high regulated country uh, to form companies um, that it is, and the professional advisors who are there who are forming the companies, or are, who, uh, let's say the auditors of the companies. They are really rigid in sticking to their rules and reg regulations, and one of the reasons that, as to me, it's my thinking, is I like Singapore, is that if my clients are able to satisfy the rules and regulations of the Singapore authorities, then that must mean that they're okay. 
Let's just say we have to agree to disagree on the role of Singapore. We've had a, a number of cases of uh, corruption and money laundering where Singapore was the heart. Uh, in fact, in one of the undercover filming we did, someone described it as Singapore is the new Switzerland. So um, perhaps different of opinion on Singapore. I think you're right that money is moving from Switzerland to Singapore. I think you're 100% right on that. But my experience, my experience is that the regulation in Singapore is much, much tougher than what it is in Switzerland. That's interesting to hear. Well, we, 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 well this comes back to my point in that, well, you know, states, countries are sovereign states and they are, they are quite able uh, to create their own tax rules. Well, when we're talking about this, you know, um, homogenized, EU central public register or, cent or, or individual countries registers, we, we still have to we still have to remember that we are talking about competitive tax jurisdictions. So you're so so you're going to get those jurisdictions. Say for instance, so maybe maybe just for an example, some of the Caribbean uh, financial centres that that do, that that doesn't do not have in place manufacturing. Do you not have other ways of, of making money apart from being a financial services sector? So the pressures on them are going to be different, say, than the pressures on the UK, which has a very broad and diverse uh, economy. And so you're going to have countries where, 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 where it's not going to get the forefront. The forefront is going to be income and, and collection of, 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 of monies, either via the um, employment of, of uh, expat professionals, uh, structures, various structures. In other words, you know, tax this this homogenous tax um, world is not going to. It's not going to be one that they wish or will be part of. Perhaps Alex, you could talk a bit about the tax competition idea. I mean, there's an interesting uh, question here. One of the one of the reasons for the political pushback against earlier efforts to to close down tax havens, to use that rather unfortunate language, um, was exactly the sense that it was picking unfairly on jurisdictions that really had very few other options in most cases. Um, now. Uh, as I've said, I think this this time round we're going in a different and much more positive um, direction in terms of the change we're expecting. But still, we're ultimately moving towards a position where some of the advantages for those jurisdictions around opacity um, look like they're either going to be taken off the table, or if they're left, they will be left with a very small bit of relatively dirty business only attached with a reputational implication. So the economic opportunities for those jurisdictions will get smaller and I think markedly smaller in in some of those cases that you mentioned Geraldine where there really is a very high dependence on a certain sort of business. So I think it's incumbent upon uh, the OECD, the G8, G7, G20 in thinking about these steps also to be considering some of the reasons why for example, the UK, um, 50 or so years ago, was so keen to push some jurisdictions in this direction, it was effectively to get them off the books as kind of aid uh, requiring jurisdictions. There will need to be serious work done on economic alternatives that, that give some directions. Not every place can become a tourist centre or um, a centre for, let's say, some sort of uh, ethical... Um, uh, but, 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 but that supposes that, that that presupposes, Alex, that tax havens are bad. Uh, well, we don't use the term tax haven partly because there's no good objective definition for it. We prefer to talk about secrecy jurisdictions, and I think it is certain that secrecy jurisdictions are bad. Um, what we're looking at isn't shutting down financial activity per se. It's raising the level of financial transparency of that activity and for some jurisdictions where the, the, the real the one advantage they have is a relative lack of transparency 
then that is going to be a difficult process. It doesn't preclude them at all from conducting good financial business, but if they are relatively dependent on more opaque business, then it is going to affect their business model. As it should be, as it, it should be. But, but, but my, my, my final, we're coming up to the end of our time here, um, I, I will ask for final thoughts from everybody. My, my final thought is, is the, the, um, what worries me is the EU uh, uncooperative list of jurisdictions that were just issued, of which the OECD has issued a, a press release distancing themselves. I, 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 I am mindful, ha, ha, come from um, having having Caribbean parentage, that it's not it doesn't this this uh, um, transparency, this bets profit shifting discussions that that are taking place to, to, does not does not divide the world into a them and us uh, scenario or, or, or into a bullying bullying scenario. I, I certainly hope that there can be uh, more assistance, more um, more disclosure between jurisdictions, and um, and that there is transparency. Because at the end of the day, who what what do we want to end? We want to end tax evasion. We want to end uh, money going into uh, drug laundering or terrorism groups. I mean, I mean that is the overall that that is the aim. Yeah, not not to have a, a them and us situation. So, so coming to our final thoughts, Peter, uh, what, what would what would yours be? Well, I think the world is heading in the right direction of transparency, um, and and mutual assistance and and sharing information uh, in the interest that we can drive out the bad guys from the business. Um, I do think there's an in, a very interesting alternate. Uh, hypothesis that there may be a very bright future for the low tax jurisdictions um, in that they may well be able to attract substantial banks of professional advisors to go and work there, which would then represent a large uh, bank of substance companies that are actually based there. And once the companies that are based there have a substantial substance in their own right, then purely from a tax viewpoint, the inquiries that the revenue authorities are going to make are going to be less less probing. Uh, that doesn't get away from those entities potentially still being used for money laundering and terrorism. But if the professional advisors of those entities being formed for that purpose, then in the end there will be only one or two jurisdictions around the world where those entities can be formed and it will be patently obvious why those entities have been formed in that ju jurisdiction. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Maxim, final thoughts? Um, yes, I will agree with the Peter and with the other panelists that uh, it's a good idea to be more transparency. And uh, I think that uh, this uh, classical uh, offshore financial centers should change their model in the way of the more substance in their territory, not just to be a paper company, to have a paper company, but to have a real company in this uh, jurisdiction. Have more substance uh, to hire people, either local ones or from abroad, and uh, this will help change their model. Uh, yes, of course, you the, those countries should uh, uh, think about their tax system, but uh, if they will change their business model in this way, it will help them to develop. And uh, maybe this will help those countries uh, to, to step forward in their bright future in this way. So uh, I agree that the issue of the substance will be the crucial in the terms of the taxation in the future. And this will help those countries. But uh, in case that uh, we uh, the, the EU uh, or uh, OECD countries will uh, make their policy too strictly, too, um, too complex. Uh, and this will be a mess 
principle should be step by step, uh, year by year, not everything together, but uh, it's, it's too complicated to do everything in two years. And uh, I think uh, it's a good direction, transparency, but uh, it should be a precise way. So, 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 so step by step. Thank you, Maxine. Alex, final thoughts? Uh, well, I, I think you raised a very important point, Gerald, and it's it's great that we we kind of we all see this um, process going towards more transparency, but it is important to uh, to reflect on the power dynamics, um, and if it collapses back into putting pressure on small jurisdictions um, while the major economies don't do their share, then it won't provide the kind of benefits globally and it will be very unfair on those jurisdictions um, and, the, and the people who live there. So the kind of work that, that we do with the, the Financial Secrecy Index, which combines secrecy and scale in terms of uh, the global importance of different economies, is an attempt to push back on this, this the, the kind of listing that the EU has just come out with of, of the usual suspects. You know, and the, the Financial Times ran a very nice article that quoted us, and the OECD both said that that list was um, was a nonsense, um, and we Excellent. don't agree so strongly that often. Um, you know, <laughs> precisely because it's because it's unfair. You know, it's saying, look at these little guys over here, when you know we're not even including Luxembourg because they're an EU member. Come on. Yes. We, we need uh, exactly as you say to, to get away from that kind of bullying. honest, honest, honest. Dialogue. Yeah, 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 and raising the bar across the uh, across the place, not not just picking on a few. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Robert, final thoughts. Yes, just to pick up on that, I think it's interesting that no EU state listed the United States, despite the fact it is easier to get an anonymous company in the United States out of every other country in the world apart from Kenya. The US is the like, easiest place to get an anonymous. So at Global Witness, we have a whole campaign focused on getting the change of rules in the United States. Um, it's actually one of, our bigger, one of our bigger areas of work. I mean, ultimately, as I think I've said many times before, this is about the sort of world society economy we want to live in. And personally, from my perspective and from the organization's perspective, we want to see where one where we have growth and business and entrepreneurship, but we also have accountability and transparency. And I think that's the direction we're going. So we're not there yet. This is at the very beginning of the journey. Um, things are going to go wrong along the way. Um, we're not going to have the perfect solution. But I think we're starting to see um, a move towards greater transparency, greater accountability. And I think that will be better for all of us, frankly. It, I mean, except perhaps for the criminals who will have less places to hide. Excellent. I, I, I could not have put it any better, Robert. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for a very interesting debate, which um, I believe will only go on and on and on. Thank you very much. Matteo? Thank you. Yes, on behalf of uh, TaxLink, I wanted to uh, thank uh, the five of you for participating in this panel, uh, Peter, Geraldine, Maxime, Alex, and Robert. I think uh, it was very useful, and I think our members uh, are going to really love it. Uh, we will be putting the uh, video up uh, in a few days. Uh, it's not a video recording, but the audio of the uh, panel. And uh, Masha, our community manager, also thanks you for, uh, for you know, uh, taking the time to be here with us. And we'll have a blog post on the event. I'm going back to the event, so there's going to be a lot of information out there. So you know, once again, uh, thanks a lot, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much.